briefly recap what we covered in the first part, the German battlecruiser Goeben headed into the Mediterranean in the first part of the 1910s as part of a Mediterranean division in response to conflicts in the Balkans. Goeben would be stationed in the Mediterranean when the First World War broke out, making its way to Constantinople, where the ship in the cruiser Breslau would be transferred to the Ottoman Navy and participate in operations against the Russian forces in the Black Sea. Goeben sustained serious damage from coastal batteries, ships, and mines. Somehow, with minor repairs, by May of 1915, the ship was still afloat and fighting. On May 2nd, the Russian fleet began a bombardment campaign off the coast of the Bosphorus Straits, in support of the Allied landings at Gallipoli. At 7.50, Goeben would head off in the direction of the Allied fleet, with the intention of taking them on off the Dardanelles. But at 10.30pm, the German commander Admiral von Usedom cancelled the operation, and Goeben anchored off Bekos at 3.45 on May 3, 1915. To counter the Allied landings in the Dardanelles and the Russian bombardment, German and Turkish cruisers were sent in the Black Sea to do reconnaissance and commerce raiding. On the morning of May 6th, Goeben would head off to the Crimean coast, where at 3.20 in the morning on the 8th of May, Sevastopol was in sight, but Goeben instead headed back to the Bosphorus, where the next morning the Russian fleet appeared off the Ottoman coast, and Goeben was at sea by 1 in the afternoon. Goeben would head into an engagement against Russian battleships and cruisers. The following day at 7.35 in the morning, of the 10th of May, Russian ships formed in the line of battle, and at 7.50, they began firing at Goeben, to which Goeben took two hits from Russian main battery guns. Goeben would increase speed to increase the range, and by 8.12 in the morning, the Russian guns ceased firing. Goeben would fire over 100 main battery shells in that engagement alone. After dodging some torpedoes, Goeben would draw the Russians away, and then eventually Goeben would head back to the Bosphorus, arriving there at 6 p.m., the remainder of May would see repairs and the demounting of 150mm guns that were damaged in the previous engagement. These guns were then sent to the Dardanelles. Goodwin would host the surviving crew of SMS Emden, a story that we'll cover at some point. Goodwin wouldn't see much action over the next two months, but on August the 8th, was sent over to go assist coal steamers who were being held up by Russian destroyers. By the 10th, Goodwin met up with the coal steamers in the process making their way to Constantinople. One steamer was lost to a submarine. Two more submarines would be spotted along the way, with a torpedo passing 2,000 meters astern. The next month, Goeben would not make it in time to assist a Turkish cruiser escorting steamers, which were under attack by Russian destroyers, in the process losing over 10,000 tons of coal. Later on in September, Goeben would be again sent to engage Russian destroyers while escorting coal steamers, both sides scoring no hits on each other. Goeben's war dire would complement the Russian destroyers for their excellent movement. These escort missions would continue until early October, when Bulgaria would join the war on the side of the Central Powers, and Goeben would be sent to show the flag off the coast of Bulgaria. Goeben, in early November, would be sent to continue these escort missions, in the process dodging torpedo attacks from Russian submarines. Again in January of 1916, Goeben would be sent to escort more steamers, and at 8.23 in the morning on January the 8th, two Russian destroyers were spotted, and Goeben pursued them. But at 9.15, a thick smoke cloud was spotted from the Russian dreadnought Imperatrika Ekaterina II, which was part of a class of three dreadnoughts built for the Black Sea Fleet, which were similar to the Ganget class built for the Baltic Fleet. Anyway, at 9.40, the Russian dreadnought opened fire on Goeben, which Goeben turned and returned fire. By 9.44, Goeben would be forced to cease fire as the shots fell short. The Russian dreadnought would continue to fire on Goeben until 10.10 in the morning. As this was going on, Goeben seek to disengage, but the Germans found it hard to do so, as the Russian ship increased speed to almost that of Goeben, as the ship was not in great condition at this point. By 1040, Goeben was able to make it out of the engagement unscathed. Goeben's next large mission would be in early February, where the ship received orders to transport men and war material to the front at Trebizond, which continued until the 4th of February. Goeben returned the Bosphorus on the 7th and would not do much for the rest of the month. From March until June, Goeben would have repairs done as well as a period of training that would include various forms of shooting practice, including with torpedoes. On July the 2nd, Goeben would head out to intercept transports heading for the Caucasus front. By July the 4th, Goeben had crossed the Black Sea and was arriving at Tuapas at 2.40 in the afternoon, opening fire on Russian ships in port and the surrounding military installations, but sparing the town. After completing this and getting news of Russian dreadnoughts in the area, on the 6th, Goeben made its way back to the Bosphorus along the Bulgarian coast. Goeben's crew would work on the ship until the 21st, and then on the 22nd, Goeben would assist Breslau against another Russian dreadnought. The rest of the year and up until October of 1917, nothing of particular note really happened for Goeben besides training and varying amounts of work done to the ship. On October the 15th, the Kaiser visited the ship and would continue to be on and off it for several days, 
eventually departing on the 18th. Following this, the Gubin would see more exercises through November, until December the 16th when the Russians signed an armistice with the Central Powers, essentially giving them control of the Black Sea. Then in January of 1918, the German and Turkish commands approved an operation in the Aegean Sea for destroying Allied Guard forces. After spending the last week getting ready with coal and other critical necessities, by the morning of January the 20th, Gobin was on its way to fight. But boilers began failing and at 6.10 a mine was hit to port. All this did not stop Gobin from opening fire at 7.42 in the morning on the wireless station at Kefalo Bay. Gobin then engaged two monitors with both of them being sunk by Gobin. At 7.55, Gobin and Breslau began opening fire in Kefalo Bay. But at 8.26, Gobin came under attack by two airplanes and employed her flak battery against the aircraft. Breslau hit a mine at 8.31 as she ran past Gobin, along with bombs being dropped rather close to the ship. Breslau was unmaneuverable and Gobin began making an effort to try to reach the ship to put it under tow, but the problem was that there were a lot of mines between the two ships. At 8.55, Gobin hit another mine and it called for even more careful maneuvering. At 9 o'clock, Breslau struck two more mines and then another one shortly after. And with an apparent submarine in the area, Breslau began to sink. At 9.10, as more bombs fell, Gobin attempted to maneuver, but with the gyro compass out, it was even harder to do so. At 9.48, some of the boilers came back online, and Gobin hit a third mine. By 10.05, with continuous bombs being dropped on the ship, the Ottoman Air Force arrived, which finally drove off the Allied planes by 11.05. Gubbin made its way to Nagara, and without buoys the ship had placed earlier, and the compass being non-functional, Gubbin ran aground at 11.32. The following day, the battleship Torget Reis, another former German battleship, tried to pull Gubbin free. Over the next several days, Gubbin faced bombing runs from Allied planes, with some finding their mark, on the beach ship. But, by the 26th, the ship was pulled free and made its way to Constantinople, arriving by the 27th. With the holes from the mines apparently not being an issue, the next couple of months for Gobin would again be pretty uneventful, until May of 1918, when Gobin would arrive off the coast of Crimea, where they were careful to enter harbor, as some of the ships were under Ukrainian flag. And by 710, Gobin was in Sevastopol Harbor. Gobin would again head into actual dry dock on June the 7th. The holes from the mines were not repaired, but the bottom of the ship was to be scraped and painted. Some other work was done while in dock, but Gobin would leave by the 14th. Gobin would go around showing the flag in Russian cities like Novorossiysk and Odessa for the next month or so. Then in August, repair work finally begun on those holes and continued until October the 19th. As Turkey bowed out of the war on November 1st, 1918, Gobin's crew were forced to leave for Odessa, ending the World War I career for the ship. The ship would remain inactive until 1927, when a French company would modernize the ship for three years, and it would serve in the Turkish Navy until being decommissioned in December of 1950. The Turkish government offered the West German government to purchase her in 1963, but they refused, and eventually the ship was scrapped in 1976. Gubbin's career was an interesting one to say the least, from being chased by British battlecruisers in the Mediterranean, to fighting Russian battleships in the Black Sea, and outliving a lot of the ships of the Kaiserliche Marina. It would have been interesting to see the West German government purchase the ship and turn it into a museum ship. Being able to visit a German battlecruiser would have been something. Thanks again for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe.